Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Opportunistic Trader. It's just after 12:30 on December 7th, and we're joined by Ben Ryan of Commodity Research Group. Uh, Ben's been joining us to uh, talk about gold options, metals, macro uh, option strategies, a uh, whole gamut of things. Uh, how's it going today, Ben? It's going very well, Michael. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess. Take me through what you think of this recent volatility. We've uh, had a lot of activity, and I know gold is one of your primary markets. Um, you know, here we are. We're trading twelve fifty fifty, up seven dollars today, uh, and I think it's trading okay, trading holding in pretty well. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, let's start with the metals. Yeah, it's funny. I don't remember the exact time that I was on last. I think it was sometime early in November, and I remember then gold was essentially topping out around twelve forty. And I think, I don't know if you remember, but you were actually uh, commenting on our call about how this 1240 area seemed like it was going to be potentially some real resistance for gold and that it was a tough area to get over. Do you remember uh, saying that? Uh, I you know, Hopefully I was right. No, but you were yeah, right. we're, starting you to, were right. we're starting to chisel so, through. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I yeah, mean, look, I mean, when it comes it down to it. Friday it, afternoon, just like today, and uh, we, we got up, it was somewhere over if I condense the chart a little bit. It was somewhere around here, I think, I, in November, right where this 1240 area is. And you were spot on in calling a top. So good thing uh, I'm here to give you credit for correct calls. Right. You don't remember. <laughs> yeah. So there's from uh, November. So you see from November there, that's like that 1240 area. It kind of came down. And once again, you know, this 1200 area, like it's so boring. We've been talking about it for years, but it continues to show buying support. So you know, while gold had failed up in the 1300 range and now it's back down in the 1200s, it's at least, you know, continuing to show that there's support at this 1200 level. And I think, you know, as this 1240 level, you said, starts to get taken out, I think it's possible um, that we're in the beginning of a, you know, a, another minor up leg where we've put in a bottom again at 1200. And, you know, I think next resistance levels are probably at least uh, 25 to $50 higher. So, it's an interesting time to keep an eye on gold here because, you know, when you take out a level like this 1240 area that you had talked about on the medium short to medium term, um, when you take out a level that has shown good selling, it usually means that the sellers have moved away a little bit, and perhaps have raised the level at which they want to start selling again. They're going to be less aggressive in this area. So uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, uh, Earlier in the year, it was definitely trading heavy. Uh, dollar has weakened a bit, but I think gold has actually outperformed where uh, the dollar kind of would maybe imply it. So it definitely seems like it uh, is trading uh, okay. And yeah, you know, so I'll take the levels. startup. You mentioned the year to date, so you can I can remove this big oval. I'll tell you why I had it uh, before. But um, so here, so if you take a look here, sorry, if you take a look here, I'm looking now at the three day, but the year to date. So at the bottom of the chart, you'll notice we're looking at, uh, pardon me there, you'll notice we're looking at the beginning of the year here on gold, it's trading at about 1320. So gold's off about 70 handles on the year. And one thing I'd want to look at is like, okay, what are the main drivers and things that affect gold? And, you know, like most commodities, when the dollar is strong, the commodities tend to be weak. So a strong dollar would generally be uh, make it a tough environment for gold. So as we bring up this uh, dollar chart, you can see back here at the beginning of the year, the dollar was trading about 92, and now it's trading, you know, 96, 70, somewhere around there. Um, so the dollar's up, you know, five or so percent. So in a year where the dollar's up five or so percent for gold to be down kind of a similar amount, actually, um, from 1325 here trading around 1250, you're looking at about a 5% down move in gold. And that seems very much in step. Um, if you're just looking at this from, from a distance, it seems very normal. Dollar up about 5% on the year, gold down 5% on the year. Nothing too exciting about that. It all seems to make decent sense with you know, what we expect to see historically. Yeah, so take me through on the option side, you know, what looks interesting here? I know you kind of want to look at some uh, year and review sort of stuff. Uh, I guess uh, you sure. take us through. That. Sure. Well, we can go. Yeah, we can go back to the charts in a little bit. But um, the one thing I wanted to talk about again, you know, this has been such a, a big thing in the news as far as options go, is what happened to optionsellers.com. And I'm sure, you know, it's been talked about plenty here. But I think 
I think there are some real implications. And I think I want to just talk about the idea of um, where options stand right now in sort of a greater context and some of what's going on, I think, in the wider world. So I think that, you know, if you take a look at the chart of the S&P over the course of, you know, 10 years or something like that, you can see that, you know, for this period from sort of 2000, you know, 10 sort of here to 2014 on, it's sort of just kind of a one way train, you know, going up. And recently we're starting to see some more volatility get introduced. And I think that, you know, I was having this conversation the other day, I, I, Michael, if you have an opinion on it, feel free to share, but that a lot of the hedge funds this year are struggling because a lot of them are regular option sellers because they like the consistency of expected returns because they know how much they're selling. And so long as it finishes out of the money, they're fine. But in a market where the volatility has been low, because as we look at this chart for years, you've sort of seen this steady grind up in the S&P. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong, wrong chart here. There, that looks better. I knew something was wrong. So as you see the steady grind up in the S&P 2012 on, um, this is a, a perfect environment for options to get sold cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now you're starting to see some more volatility introduced in the market. And for those option sellers, they're in a precarious place because, you know, as an option seller, if you're selling just to collect premium, you know, the ball's really not in your court. And if you start to see volatility perform at a multiple of what it had been previously, you're going to see some of these people really get hurt. And option sellers is the big name that everyone's been talking about. But I think that there are, you know, are other people who are starting to see as volatility returns to the markets a little bit that selling options um, are starting to be the, uh, the end of a lot of people and a lot of fund managers. So people are going to look to, you know, to consider how they might or be a little more careful, I think. And certainly the option seller uh, group that I know was active in gold for many years um, because they had to cover, obviously, net gas, um, where a lot of problems were. Crude as well, where, you know, crude came off hard and you saw the puts and crude get bid and they were short those as well from what I understand. So a lot of sellers across these commodity markets, even though um, it might not seem like a big deal, this was a seller that was consistently there that options traders could rely on knowing that at the end of the day, there was with pretty, uh, pretty consistent, continuous regularity. At the end of the day, this guy or this group option sellers was going to come in and sell strangles or sell calls or sell puts and they did it you know, consistently. So now that sort of that lean thing that you can lean on, that there's always going to be somewhere to buy is gone, particularly in the gold, which I understand, uh, you know, most, that's actually kind of a big deal. And I think it likely is going to increase the amount that, um, you know, of, of volatility, it's going to take away some of the offers in the market. And, and it's just naturally going to cause vol to go higher. And I wanted to say along that line, which I thought was amazing, is that, um, you know, this was not just a, um, it was a nat gas event, right? That's where the event took place, or perhaps crude, you know, where the biggest damage took place because nat gas had this enormous move and listeners to, you know, oppor opportunistic trader, hopefully were not on that side if they were listening to Mark Fisher's many warnings about the, the way that uh, nat gas was behaving and how it was looking like a classic bottom. You know, you would have been safe, hopefully. Hopefully all the listeners were, were listening. But um, if, if you look, just because that's where the damage took place, these groups like option sellers who have positions across multiple markets, when they get crushed in one market, they're forced to cover elsewhere. So what you saw in gold, for instance, and this is amazing to me just in terms of the number, if you think about it, the June of 9, 1600 calls were trading approximately 80 cents in the market. That Monday or Tuesday after, you know, when the liquidation began, those calls, which this one individual was short so many of, went to $2.30. So from $0.80 cents to $2.30. And gold at the time basically was unchanged. It might have been up slightly. So it wasn't because of a move up. It was just because of supply and demand for those options. So the calls went from $0.80 cents to $2.30. The Ds of nine 1,800 calls went from $1.60 to $3.30, basically in the span of a day. And um, I just found that fascinating, you know, and it's just such an important caution for, you know, listeners and people who are going to be in the options market, 
you know, when you look at a model, it's going to tell you that if you go up a certain amount, your option value will change by X amount. But what you don't see in the models and what a lot of these hedge funds won't have in their models is that a fund blows up and it completely shifts the supply demand dynamics within that market. And what I, I think is so interesting is snack gas. It's not an isolated incident because when you have a group that is um, you know, forced to liquidate across multiple markets, it can really have an impact and change those dynamics. And I was curious earlier, if you hear, take a look here at the options board that I have, if you look down the middle, uh, this is just the strike. So we're here trading 1250, which is the at the money. But I went and I decided to take a look at where those options are now. The June of 19s that we had discussed uh, that a couple of weeks ago, granted gold's a little higher, but these are small delta options. So we, I took a look at the June of 19, 1600 calls. And right now, as you see on the left, this is 190. That's the bid at $2.10. So the middle on that is $2. So if you remember what I said, I mentioned that in that day, they went from about 80 cents to $2.30. Here they are still trading $2. So um, there, there is certainly some uh, strength that has remained. You know, the, the effects of that cover um, still remain in the market clearly as vol is more bid than before, or at least those calls are more bid than before the, um, before the blowout took place. And then if I take a look up here at the DSIV, um 9, 1800 calls that we mentioned that went from 160 to 330, those are now $3.50 bid at $4.50. Um, so maybe with gold moving $20 higher, that put about 50 cents into it. But generally, the level that that option is bid is very similar to where that um, particular person or whoever it was that blew out that day covered. So um, I just wanted to point that all out, Michael. I think it's easy for um, you know, people to see an event in the news and think, okay, you know, one-time thing, no big deal, but the implications in markets, you know, weeks later, uh, you, you continue to see them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's actually pretty interesting price action right now. Nat gas, it has been trading very well. We're trading right now at 450. But uh, given all that volatility, we're still, uh, you know, we've actually calmed down around this 450 level. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's a beast, that Nat gas. You know, I've never traded it personally. Uh, but I certainly have a lot of respect for, you know, the, the people who hang in because sometimes, I mean, how long was Nat Gas dead for? I mean, it was, you know, and, and that's a reminder about <laughs> how, how these markets can be. You can sit and it's the most boring commodity in the world until it isn't. And then when it isn't, you can make all the money. And, um, you know, there were uh, there were a lot of people. This is also just an important thing to consider about being short options. Right. Everybody's like we talked about earlier, the hedge funds like doing it because it you know, provides a consistent uh, level of return that they can sort of rely on and predict because they know how much they're selling, assuming, you know, 90 to 95 percent of the time, the thing, the strangles are, that they're selling expire worthless and they collect, you know, a premium in a predictable way. And investors like to see that. And it looks nice uh, because you can look at consistency of returns. But you're you know, you're kind of sitting on a ticking time bomb because over time, you know, while you may be able to go two, three, four years and raise money around a strategy that starts to work, you're going to get caught if you don't, you know, um, it's not even about being careful. Eventually, events just happen. One percent, you know, half percent, two, three, four standard deviation events, they happen occasionally. And if your strategy is just to sell, 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 you know, you're, you're going to be in a tough spot. So um, it, it's an important lesson, I think, to realize that the position that you have, if you're a seller of options, right? And we talk about this, you know, we talk about one by twos. Sometimes I talk about buying one by twos that we like. I know Vince talks about that a lot on his show. And in a one by two, when you're buying a one by two, you're going to, um, you're going to have negative deltas to infinity. Meaning if I buy a 1275 call and sell two 1300 calls, it's great if we go to 1300 and make 25 bucks. I could have done it flat premium. It's a huge trade. But if we go to 1500, you know, I'm in blowout territory. I'm, I'm down, you know, $175 on the trade. And that's what happens occasionally as these markets move. So I think it's important for, you know, people to keep an eye and, and just remember that if you were positioned with lots of those short options before that NAC gas situation, you were in a blowout potentially. It wasn't just option sellers. 
who blew out. I mean, I, I know of other groups that blew out as a result of it because they had net short option exposure um, to the top. And by net short options, it means that on a big move, as you go to infinity, what's your delta? Are you long or are you short? And if you're short on a move of that size and that gas, it doesn't matter what happens after. You're, you're kind of married to your position and some people made a boatload of money and other people are you know, looking for new jobs. So just keep in mind that you're always at that risk if you're net short options to the upside. You, know, you have a lot of people out there who tout the virtues of selling options and sometimes it makes a lot of sense to sell options. But um, as a strategy or just long term, if you're going to always be net short to the upside or net short to the downside, uh, short options, that is, you're just always going to put yourself in a position to blow out. And nobody should be surprised about what happened. You know, when people get complacent and manage to strategies like that, ultimately, they're going to blow up. And it just so happened that it happened a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you hear stories about it all the time. Uh, even back in February, as a matter of fact, you look at a lot of firms' returns. Uh, people were selling puts, puts. You know, 2018 was a remark, or 2017, I should say, was a remarkable year where we had very little volatility, very few one percent days in the equity markets. And then, you know, uh, the I think it was the first, yeah, it was the first two or three days of February. We just uh, the markets went down heavily. So anybody who was selling naked puts got crushed there. Yeah, it's a it's a tough one uh, to go with. And I, you know, I thought I'd just bounce over, you know, now that I've kind of set the uh, done the um, public warning and a public announcement warning about selling options, which I always feel obligated to do largely because there are so many people out there for so long who touted just the opposite, though I do think we'll start to see that change, um, you know, as a result of some of what we've seen. But, you know, just talking about gold, generally going back to, you know, looking at this. So this is the year to date in gold. So we're here trading, started the year about 1320 down to 1250. So I like to look back in time as we've discussed, and maybe we'll just do that for a moment. And then we'll talk about what's going on with the Fed and, you know, how the, the sort of the narrative alongside the price action, how that all starts to match up. So I'll take a look here over 180 days. And this is, uh, you'll see now the reason for this enormous oval that I've put on the screen. So this is looking at gold since um, April. And you see where it topped out there at about 1370. Um, since then, the size of that oval is essentially gold in a downtrend. And that begins in, call it mid-April, to basically um, the downtrend sort of stops at least here around uh, mid-September. So you're looking about five months where gold was, you know, for more or less occasional rallies, but ultimately getting sold down. And from top to bottom, as you can see, down to 1167, you're looking at about a, a $200 move down in the gold. Um, so what's happened since then? Uh, really kind of a lot of sideways action, as you see out here until um, October. But once again, the level 1200 starts to reestablish itself. And then we came up, as you look further to the right to the chart, to that 1240 area, Michael, where you had, you know, last we talked, mentioned that this was a tough spot for gold goes back once again down towards that 1200 level. Once again, there are buyers and here we are just starting to eclipse this level. So again, I like to look for spots where we can clearly see that there's a downtrend that's changed, that, that's stopped at least for the moment. So we're either in an you know, uptrend or we're in sort of an in-between phase right now. But I like looking here because I, I like the fact that this 1240 level on the short term of a couple of months is starting to get taken out and that means that maybe those um, offers are going to start to back off a little. And if that happens, I think you have room to run here on the chart up to this, you know, 1300 level or so, maybe 1280, 1285, where you had seen some previous um, support back in May. So I think you like to look for spots that were resist uh, support. And then when the trend breaks, those places that used to be support tend to become resistance. So it looks to me like, you know, gold has about another $32 in here. Um, and that shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be a problem. And then we'll see where it sets up from there. But, uh, you know, my bias is generally, you know, towards the upside. I will say that, you know, looking at the um, calls here, as I did, you know, taking a look at like uh, one and a half month calls out, you know, you look at we're trading about 1250 here and you look at the 1300 calls on the screen, they're 550 bid at 570. So mid market would be about 560. And then I like to look at the equidistant put even though it's actually a little bit uh, closer because we're trading 1252.
but the equidistant put is 270 bit at 290. That's the 1200 put. So you see what I did? I just took this 1250 with this yellow line, which is where we're trading. And I said, all right, what's going on at 1300, $50 higher. And what's going on at 1250 lower. And the puts are basically valued at 280 and the calls are valued at five, 560. So you basically have the calls equidistant two months out valued at twice the premium uh, that the put is. So that's, um, you know, that tells you that it, it, there's no free looking gold by simply buying calls. Uh, that's, that's a pretty extreme uh, skew that you're looking at. I, I'm sure some of it comes from the fact that the blowout was in calls and the, the guy who blew out had to cover those. But uh, otherwise, I think the market is, is not being foolish about the way they're pricing the upside in gold. They're not making, giving it away for free. And, um, you know, I think that makes sense going into some of the Fed speak. I mean, before I give my opinions on it, Michael, any you know thoughts that you guys have had over there on the Fed and uh, just the general approach towards interest rates and general feelings that, you know, some of your guests have had on that? I'd love to hear. Uh, to tell you the truth, it is a bit mixed. Uh, everybody, you know, does think that they're hiking in December. Uh, but we do have some people that think that the economy is actually doing better than uh, they're basically, they're thinking that the Fed is short term rhetoric is reacting too much to the equity market m more so than the actual economy and right. that the economy is still doing fine and they're actually going to have to hike. Um, and then there are some that are saying that no, they're definitely done. Equities are heading lower. Economy's heading lower and they've gone too far. And so that, you know, I, it seems like especially Wall Street Journal reported yesterday in the close, it sounds like they're going to hike and then they're going to be data dependent. I think ultimately what it comes down to also is, you know, nobody really knows how things over the next 30 to 60 days are going to go with China. And if mm -hmm. the trade talks don't go well, that's a negative. If they go extremely well, then, uh, you know, that's a big positive and it puts us back in probably a hiking mode. So I think that's part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. So what um, I, I only caught a little bit about it. So what, what ended up happening at the G20? Was it essentially not um, not a big kind of event as far as any any big comeaways you, you mentioned two weeks what's the uh two week countdown there uh two weeks with uh, china like we'll see where china goes and in, in the coming or did you say two weeks uh, i don't think i said two weeks i, I think sorry. i said month or two um, month or two sorry uh so the walk away of uh, from g20 which you know equity markets traded higher last week on thursday and friday Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had a huge gap open on Sunday night because the walk away was, you know, that they're postponing the increase of the tariffs from 10 to 25 percent. And that the both sides said that they were going to uh, extend talks for 90 days and get a hopefully get a deal done. Uh, yeah. But everybody kind of knew that, you know, that wasn't necessarily uh, going to be as easy as either party said. And it was in both parties better interest to kind of walk away saying that things are positive. And, yeah. you know, so it was very short lived and, you know, they're at the tables right now talking, uh, which is productive, but it seems like they're still miles apart. And then there's obviously this Huawei news from over the weekend will complicate things. Uh, right. We have uh, arrested or actually the Canadian officials have arrested their CFO to uh, uh, extradite, I believe, to the United States. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see how they re uh, respond with that and what that might do. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to get too far off topic because I, I don't consider myself an expert in the in the foreign policy of it. But I do think that if you look at <clears throat> what's gone on from a from a practical standpoint, if um, you know, if the goal here is to get a big win on a better deal with China, which uh, I think we can all agree Trump would love to take credit for, should that you know should that take place, you know, Trump has really put the screws to them in the place where you know because. They're a net exporter and export, you know, uh, th th they're at the point where the tariffs are starting to hurt them more than they're hurting us. And they're in this kind of cycle where I think China's deleveraging um, a bit. And when you throw this, the tariffs at them, it really adds kind of a, a multiplier effect of heat on the government, um, you know, in China, who obviously controls so much of, you know, what's going on there and, and you know, is so active in the economy. I think it puts them in a, a tough position. And while it's not good for us, um, it's also not good for them in a, in a bigger way. So I have to think, and, and I'll be really curious to see if this is not what takes place, what the reason was, but I have to think that there's, you know, both sides have every reason to get something done or at least be able to spin it as if they did so that the market should be happy. 
Um, so I'll be very curious to see what happens. But for Trump to have gone to the lengths he has to raise tariffs, raise tariffs, raise tariffs, but simultaneously be very respectful of um, uh, President Xi in China um, in the media and, and be very you know clear about that, not starting a spat of words or something like he might with some other um, you know types of leaders. Uh, it's it seems like the benefit should be for both sides to really want to get something done. So I think that, you know, and, and that'll be interesting to see um, from an equity perspective. Um, you know, I, I, I assume that's a win from a gold perspective. I, I'm not sure if it makes all that much of a difference. I mean, I guess you could say that if inflation were to pick up as a result of it, that, uh, you know, that would be positive for gold, perhaps as a store of value. But it's not clear to me that that's, you know, that that's necessarily uh, what the outcome is going to be. I did just want to say that, you know, I had read in an article on Bloomberg, they're talking about, um, you know, this, the idea of whether or not, and it's interesting that you said uh, you have kind of different views on your, um, you know, on your calls, because I think that's actually very much the sentiment in this article, but they're talking about Vice Chairman um, Richard Florida on Tuesday weighed in on the debate over whether the drawdown might soon reach its limits saying an event in New York that he sees bank reserves as, quote, obviously abundant, a view that's at odds with some in the market. So I think the um, interesting concept there in the context of gold, when we're looking at gold, we really want to understand what is the likely, there's a strong correlation to interest rates. So the more dovish, um, you know, the Fed might be, or the more accommodative, however you want to define it, generally, the better that's going to be uh, for keeping a bid in in gold. And I, I think it's interesting that, you know, now as you start to raise a few times, I almost hear implicit in that that they feel now that they, you know, the Fed feels that because there's um, because they have some or at least in this case, because they have some interest rates that they can now cut because we're no longer at zero, that that means that that's a tool and that we can use should we need to because we have these reserves. Um, perhaps, you know, perhaps it's true. I mean, the Fed's also been, you know, selling out the bonds they've been buying and that's an important thing to consider also that the, the stock market, while we have these narratives around China and different things going on, keep in mind that the Fed stance has gone from buyer to seller. And that's made a, you know, a big difference in terms of the amount of liquidity in the markets and where that money goes. So ultimately, you know, when I look at the S&P, I don't know if you had any thoughts on it, but ultimately when I look at the uh, S&P on the longer chart, I see sort of that, um, you know, this, Let's go a little shorter here. Let's go to like a three-year day. I look at these uh, this little uptrend line here. It looks like it was you know kind of holding since 2017, starting down at 2,300, and that that kind of broke actually you know in October. Um, so when you see a big trend line like that break, it's really not shocking that the volatility is going to blow out as it has. It actually makes quite a bit of sense. But then if you look, it's it's just this 2,600 level. If it can hold, it's going to look like this level, which was also tested back here in, uh, what was this, last May uh, and held. If it holds again, then this area starts to look really strong. So um, I don't see necessarily you know, a, a reason for panic here in the S&P if this level holds. But below here, you're seeing a lot rejected, and then the volatility can really open up. So I think the Fed is probably well aware of the technical implications on the S&P, as crazy as that sounds. And as much as it seems that an independent agency maybe shouldn't be, uh, that's up for other people to debate. But I, I don't think they deny the data that's right in front of their face. And I think the S&P holding 2,600 is, is kind of what everybody wants to see. And then from there, maybe the Fed will you know, continue to be, uh, continue to be um, you know, maybe a little bit less accommodative. But I'd say below 2,600, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed starts sounding particularly dovish. Uh, that seems to be what traders talk about, but it's not necessarily what they're supposed to be doing or what they say that they're doing. Um, right. So, you know, we'll see. That's uh, part of the game that we have to see unfold. Uh, their meeting is December 19th where they, you know, it's funny, actually was priced in nearly a hundred percent. Uh, at one point yesterday, it got to about 68%, uh, percent chance of a hike. So it's no longer a hundred percent locked in, but, uh, from all the indications, it sounds like from the Fed officials, it does sound like they're going to move. It would be a shock if they did not move. Yeah, just I would just point out, and then I'll just take a quick look. I know we're going to finish up soon, but I, I like um, it's an interesting point you were just making. I wanted to bring up the three-year daily here of gold. So 
that uh, here's another end of a, uh, if you look at the chart we got up on the screen, kind of the beginning of 2016, uh, that's that uh, oval there, the very end of it represents the end of the downtrend that had lasted for about three years in gold. And then gold ultimately put in its low um, since that in 2016, around 1050. But since then, you know, gold's been in this, uh, it looked like it broke out and then it kind of faded. And then it came down here to this 11 quarter level. And then it tried to get back above this 1375 level. It couldn't, it's back and 1200 reestablishes itself. So what you're seeing is three years of a really range bound product. But what I, you know, just like I talked about 2600 level with the S&P as a point to be aware of, particularly as an option trader, you don't want to be short at, you know, these levels of resistance if you're, you know, seeing a market that's picking up in, in momentum. But if you look that it's actually interesting to note as you look along this red line as we go up that ultimately, while it's ever so slight, it's back going back into 2016, since the end of that downtrend you see that gold is essentially making, though kind of in turtle-like fashion, it is making higher lows. And you definitely want to see that as a long-term investor in gold. Um, you know, short-term, we talked about, I think 1285 is probably the next level of resistance. Um, above that, um, I think, you know, you're really looking just back to that 1375 level. And um, on the downside, below 1200, all this nice bullish talk goes away um, because it's, you know, something again that is held as support so many times we expect if it breaks um, that that's likely to become resistance. And I would definitely bail on all longs before below 1200 and gold, just because that seems like about the level where um, you would expect to see buying coming in based on the recent price action. So um, do you think gold is going to go higher because of a weak dollar because of a do you have a specific reason that you think gold is going to be trade supportive or just more price action? I think it's a couple of things. Um, you know, I read um, Ben Hunt. I don't know if you ever read his stuff, um, yeah. but he's he kind of looks at things in, in sort of a big macro picture with, you know, kind of a hint of game theory in the midst of it and everything and taking a look from a very wide global perspective. I think it's important, like, to realize I'm not when I talk about my general bullish view on gold it's based on a couple of things it's it's based on what you see here which i believe is the end of a downtrend if i could just bring that back up it's not it's not that i have a, a narrative surrounding it so much it's just that i'm looking at the price and i'm seeing that again if now we take a look at the 10 year from 2013 to 2016 we were in a downtrend and and that was you know about as clear of a downtrend as you're going to see in a market over that period of time and then in 2016, it breaks out and I, you know, you would hope that might be a downtrend, uh, uh, an uptrend starting, but it hasn't been. Ultimately, you've just seen three years, essentially, of major consolidation, but it also hasn't gone down. So on the overall chart, as I look back six, 10 years, I start to see that the selling from a period of time has been absorbed. And the buying can't necessarily win the war, but there's this major consolidation pattern that's been taking place. So that's why it's important to keep an eye on the short term um, levels like 1200 and 1375, because once they break either down from or, you know, out of or down from those levels, you can have a potential for a greater move in either direction. So far, because of these lower highs, I think gold has the bulls have a slight advantage right now. But again, below 1200, that ends everything. So I, I mentioned Ben Hunt also, and I, I think that if you're looking in the really long term picture, just as an investor, if you're viewing gold as part of your portfolio, the reason I want to have it as part of my portfolio is that while a lot of the narratives that you see out there all say prices are going down, you know, inflation's over with because we haven't had inflation so much, you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years over that period, you know, there was the 1970s did happen and can happen again, just like blowouts happen. And I'm not saying that the 70s are coming. But if I want to have protection against inflation, you know, and have a store of value, which I think most people should want to have in their portfolio, I just think gold becomes very attractive when you look at that and you compare that with the, um, you know, sort of the price action of late. From a longer term historical perspective, you know, I, I think while rates are low, inflation is also very low. And uh, I like to protect against that. So that's why, you know, I don't mind uh, holding some gold in the portfolio, though, like I said, below 1200 
all that sort of sort of goes out the window. Uh, great information. You know, a uh, lot to chew on there. Some great uh, chart displays, which is really uh, good. Uh, you know, great look at technical analysis, a great look at the uh, options. Uh, you know, Ben, I appreciate it. This is uh, Ben Ryan, Commodity Research Group. Thanks a lot, Michael. All right. We'll talk to you later. Take care.